What's going on and welcome to the Game Week 9 preview video. In today's video, we're going to be answering all the big questions ahead of Game Week 9. Should we captain Salah or should we captain Lukaku? Is it time for the Vardy party to return? Which Chelsea defender should we be targeting ahead of their game against Norwich and their nice fixture run? And which mid-price midfielders should we be looking to get into our team? So if you're excited for this video, make sure you drop a like, smash the like button, subscribe as well. We are dangerously close to one thousand subscribers so if you haven't already make sure you subscribe and let's get into the game week 9 preview video for today all right the first question today and it is a big one who should we captain Salah or Lukaku when you look ahead to this fixture and you saw that Chelsea were playing Norwich at home Everyone was thinking that they were just Captain Lukaku, no questions asked. It was a no-brainer to captain a Chelsea player against probably the worst team in the league. But Salah has been on another level this season. And recently, Manchester United have been terrible defensively. So when you couple Salah's incredible form with United's terrible form, all of a sudden we have this question about whether we should captain Salah or whether we should captain Lukaku. And when you have a look at the stats on the screen... All the stats are pointing in one direction, and that direction is to Captain Salah. When you compare Salah with Lukaku's stats, he comes out on top in all of the stats, except for the opponent's expected goals conceded in the last four matches home and away. So what that's comparing is how many goals Manchester United have been expected to have conceded in their last four games at home, because that's where the fixture will be taking place, versus how many goals have Norwich been expected to concede playing away from home in their last four. I know that Norwich have switched formation recently. They've made a few changes in defense as well, which have seen them get back-to-back -back clean sheets. But in that time, they've played Burnley and they've just played Brighton, two teams that aren't really known for their attacking potential. So the question still remains, how good are Norwich really defensively? Have these changes made a big impact to their defense or have they just come up against some easier teams? But what we do know is that right now, Salah is completely outperforming Lukaku in every single statistic that counts when you're thinking about your captain. Have a look on the screen. Salah has registered an expected goals per 90 in the last four game weeks of 0.62, which is more than double what Lukaku has been expected to get in that time. Their expected assist is the same, but Salah has registered five big chances to Lukaku's one. Salah's had 14 shots in the box to Lukaku's five. Seven chances created to six. That's a bit closer. And then you have a look at the points per match. 10.3 points per match for Salah versus 4.4 for Lukaku. Now, you might say that Salah's had some easy games, but in actual fact, Salah's played Manchester City and he's also played Chelsea. In both of those games, he's come out with double digits. Yes, they were being played at Anfield. They played at Liverpool's home ground, and Salah will be playing United away from home. But Salah, even in the big games, he is getting the returns. He's on penalties as well. And all it takes in one game is one moment for Salah to get a goal. It's the five points. He's likely to get bonus then as well. It could even be a penalty. And then Salah's very likely to get a double-digit return. It doesn't take much for a midfielder to get double digits if they just score one goal. And that's really why I like and why I prefer captaining a midfielder over captaining a forward. A forward scores a goal, it's only four points. A midfielder scores a goal, it's worth five. Yes, the forward's more likely to get bonus if they score, but a midfielder who scores, who gets forward just like Salah does with the amount of shots in the box and big chances and, and all those different statistics, Salah is much more likely to get a double-digit return than Lukaku. And you can see that on screen. 10.3 points per match this season compared to Lukaku's 4.4. So if you take all of those statistics, what does that mean? Well, it's telling us that you should captain Salah. But there's something about Chelsea playing Norwich at home that feels too good to pass up. Now, I am recording this before Chelsea play in the Champions League. Some comments from Thomas Tuchel recently around Lukaku being tired, being overplayed. He played in the, in the European Championships in the summer. He's come straight into the Chelsea team. He's playing uh, Champions League and he's playing on the weekend as well. He hasn't really had any rest in the last few months does ring some alarm bells. If he was to play 90 minutes in the Champions League, then I would have some serious concerns about his minutes at home to Norwich. 
If I'm Thomas Tuchel, playing at home to Norwich represents a decent opportunity for me to rest my striker. But if my striker's not scoring goals, on the other hand, it represents a great time for my striker to get into form. And if I'm Tuchel, I know that the key to my, t- my team's success is for Lukaku to start scoring goals. So I imagine, and I'm just predicting here, that Lukaku gets decent minutes in the Champions League, hoping that he gets a goal against Malmo, and, he com- and then he comes off early, and then he's had his rest ready to go for the weekend, but he's also got his goal, which will give his confidence a boost. What's key to Lukaku getting chances? and you can see he's only had one big chance in the last four game weeks, is the presence of Mason Mount and Kai Havertz. When Mason Mount and Kai Havertz are in that team, Lukaku gets a lot more chances. He gets a lot more expected goal data as well because these guys are supplying him with the opportunities. He has scored two goals in the most recent games, but they've both been flagged for offside. So there's no real question about the diminishing of his finishing ability. It's more about the chances that he's actually getting and the legitimate chances that he's getting. I'm expecting Mason Mount to come back into that team against Norwich, which I think will help Lukaku. But in summary, who should we captain? Is it Salah or is it Lukaku? A lot of the questions will be answered in the Champions League game. If Lukaku plays 90 minutes, doesn't get any returns, doesn't play that well, then I think I will go Salah. Just for the safety, I know that I can trust Salah with the captaincy. But if Lukaku gets a goal in the Champions League, he comes off early, he's looking good, he's looking on form, and all the signs from Tuchel and the team in in the press conferences are that he's going to start him against Norwich, then I think I will captain Lukaku. That fixture, in my eyes, is just too good to pass up. I think United will turn up at home, at Old Trafford, in front of their fans against Liverpool. So right now, my captain's armband is on Lukaku. But what is key is having both of these guys in your team. If you're on Ronaldo and you don't have Lukaku, make that transfer. Get Lukaku into your team. And it's a good question. It's a good problem to have this week. Salah or Lukaku? I don't really know if there's a wrong answer. If you go Lukaku, then you've got justification for doing that. If you go Salah, then you've got justification for doing that. And in FPL, we're going to make the right decisions at times, and we're going to make the wrong decisions at times, but outcomes are out of our control. Understanding all the information at hand to make a decision is what we can control, but we can't control the outcome. And right now, stats are pointing to Salah. Norwich at home and their defensive data is probably pointing towards Lukaku. So there's justification for both. Right now, I'm on Lukaku. We'll wait and see what happens in the Champions League and whether that means I switch over to Salah. All right, is it time for the return of the Vardy party? If you started with Jamie Vardy from the beginning of the season, congratulations, you've absolutely smashed it. He's a player that's completely gone under the radar. Everyone's been focusing on Ronaldo or Lukaku up front. No one's really been looking at Jamie Vardy, and in that time, he's raced to the top of the golden boot race along with Salah. He's been scoring at seven points per match. So Jamie Vardy has been doing so well for Leicester despite Leicester really starting the season quite poorly. Interesting comments from Brendan Rodgers the other day, kind of taking the blame for Leicester's poor start to the season. He said that their poor start was a result of him picking the wrong system and the wrong players in that system. Now, all fingers are now pointed at Harvey Barnes and the fact that he had Ian Nacho on the bench. Ian Nacho was arguably Leicester's best player last season, but he started this season on the bench as Rodgers was playing a 4-2-3-1, but they've switched now to playing three at the back with their wing backs, meaning they can play two up top. What's been key to this is the return of Johnny Evans, meaning that Brendan Rodgers now has three centre backs that he can actually play. He did play Amadi against Manchester United. We'll wait and see whether Vestergaard comes back into that team after his injury. But if they play Johnny Evans, Soyanchu, and Vestergaard as a three-man defence, then they can play their wing backs, and it means that Vardy is playing up top with Ian Acho. And when he's playing with Ian Acho, what we saw last season is that his expected goals actually dropped, but his expected assists started to go up. So it'll be interesting to see now that Ian Acho is starting, whether Vardy's goals will drop, whether his expected goals will drop, and whether his expected assists will go up. But right now, Across the last four game weeks, he's got an expected goals per 90 of 0.61, which is similar to what Salah had. So that's the kind of levels that he's getting the expected data at. His expected assists per 90 is just 
0-8. So pretty much nothing to speak of there. Shots in the box, 21. Nine chances created. And his expected goal involvement across the last four game weeks is 3.17. So really healthy statistics from Jamie Vardy. But the question is, how do you afford him? How do you fit him into your team? At priced at 10.4, he's very difficult to get into your team if you've already got Lukaku and you've already got Salah in midfield. And right now, I think the two premiums to go with would be Salah and Lukaku. Lukaku is not getting the points return that Jamie Vardy is, but in the short term, Chelsea's fixtures are a lot nicer. Chelsea across the next three, they've got Norwich this week, then they've got Newcastle next week. When you have a look at Leicester's fixtures, they've got Brentford, Arsenal, Leeds, Chelsea, Watford, and Southampton. Bit of a mixed bag. Have a look at the expected goals conceded of Jamie Vardy's opponents across the next six or so game weeks. Brentford's expected goals conceded is quite similar to Leeds and Chelsea, but the narrative around all these three teams is quite different. So the narrative around Leeds is that they're a soft, leaky defense. The narrative around Chelsea is that they're a really strong, tight defense. People are thinking about getting double, if not triple, Chelsea defense. But their expected goals conceded is similar to Leeds, similar to Southampton and Brentford as well. The reason for that is Mendy has been saving Chelsea. So looking at Jamie Vardy's fixtures, they don't really stand out to me as super appealing until around game week 13 when he plays Watford. But the question you have to ask yourself then is Spurs go on a really nice run from around game week 12. And do you get Jamie Vardy or do you get Harry Kane into your team? My preference would be to go with Harry Kane. And so right now, I think Lukaku is a better asset than Jamie Vardy. And then when game week 12 and game week 13 comes around, I think Harry Kane is a better asset than Jamie Vardy. So how do you fit him into your team without making lots of sacrifices elsewhere? For me, I just don't think he comes into my team. And I know that a lot of managers will benefit from his points. I'm not saying Jamie Vardy won't score across these fixtures, but I just think that there are better options. And I think that right now I would rather go with Lukaku for his three fixtures coming up. And then I would rather switch to Harry Kane than have Jamie Vardy in my team. If you do want a Leicester forward for their fixture run, I think Ian Acho might be worth a punt. Wait until game week 13 though, Make sure that he's confirmed in that team. Leicester do have some strikers on the bench. Daka has looked really good when he's come on. And I just, I don't fully know that Ian Acho is nailed. He very rarely completes 90 minutes as well. Daka's often coming on towards the end of games. And as the Europa League continues, what's that going to do to Ian Acho and his rotation? If Ian Acho is nailed and playing 90 minutes, he's definitely coming into my team around game week 13 when they play Watford there. Watford with the worst expected goals considered of all these teams on screen. So I'm looking at Ian Acho, but right now, the Vardy party, I'm not coming to the Vardy party. All right, we're seeing a real shift in midfield away from guys like Ben Rama, Greenwood, Jota. A lot of people have been frustrated with Jota's rotation. I think if you buy someone like Jota, you know that you're going to get bitten by the rotation at some point and you just have to accept it. But nevertheless, people are starting to move away from these players and they're starting to think about who they should get to replace them in midfield. So on screen, I put together some of the replacements that I would consider as mid-price midfielders if you're wanting to get rid of guys like Greenwood and Ben Rama and Jota. These are the players that I would consider in your team. And they range there from 5.5 all the way up to Foden at 8 million. But if I was going to rank them as most essential to least essential, I would say that Rafinha still comes out on top. Frustrating to see him miss that game due to the international break. It looks as though with the scheduling of Brazil's fixtures for the next international break around game week 9 or game week 10, that Rafinha should be able to return and play the following weekend for Leeds. So we shouldn't have a repeat of what just happened. I think Rafinha... He's going to be so confident now after those two goals for Brazil. The way he played for them was incredible. He's kind of carrying the Leeds team at the moment. They really need him to start or at least to continue performing for them if they want to start picking up points and moving up the table. Once Bamford returns to that team, I think it'll make them more of a potent attacking team as well. Rafinha is a pretty well-rounded player. 
A lot of the guys on screen here are either a lot better at their expected goals than their expected assists, or they're a lot better at their expected assists than their expected goals. And Mbwemo or Mbubo is a good example of that. But Rafinha is a fairly well-rounded player in terms of his output and what he offers. He's getting 4.4 points per game. He's got Wolves at home in game week nine. I don't think that's the easiest fixture. But Norwich away in game week 10, he could see some big points in that game. Typically, Rafinha doesn't have the highest of ceilings, but he's always threatening. And if he's going to get a double-digit return, it's very likely to be against Norwich. Leeds fixtures, their good fixture run kind of coming to a bit of an end now, which is a shame. He's missed some of their really good games. But I still think Rafinha's a good shout. If you want a ticket to the Pep Roulette, right now Foden looks to be the ticket to buy in that team. He's kind of playing as that false nine out of position. Five shots in the box. He's averaging at 4.2 points per game. He's only played three or four games in the league. He kind of had a bit of a rest following the European Championship, but now he's come into the starting team for Manchester City. Tielemans is someone that not many people are talking about. He's got the best expected assists of all players on screen across the last four game weeks. However, he doesn't offer much in terms of expected goals. Yes, he did score that great goal against Manchester United last game week. Although, I just don't think we can expect Yuri Tielemans to be scoring too many goals moving forward. But playing in that new formation, I think with players like Ian Acho and Vardy in front of him, I think his expected assist will, will continue to rise. I think he'll still offer a lot in that chance creation department. So if you've got a bit of cash and you want to move from Ben Rama, I think you could do worse than go to Yuri Tillemans. As I said with Jamie Vardy, I think game week 11 and game week 13 are kind of the times to jump on a Leicester player. Brentford away is not too bad. Arsenal's defense have been good recently. So playing Arsenal at home is not the easiest game. Leeds in game week 11, but and then Chelsea, and then they've got Watford after that. So I think Yuri Tillemans is a decent shout. Now, Conor Gallagher, he's someone at the start of the season a lot of people were considering, but in the last four game weeks, he's really gone off the boil. Palace have had a couple of difficult matches in that time, but have a look at his expected assists and expected goals data, basically next to nothing. So Conor Gallagher right now, despite Crystal Palace's good fixtures, they've got City away in game week 10, but apart from that, their fixtures are really nice. If I was going to get a Crystal Palace player, I would go Wilfred Zaha. I'd want to confirm his fitness first. I think Edward up front is a decent shout, but Conor Gallagher, if you are considering him, I just want to see a little bit more from him. In the last four game weeks, his statistics haven't been good, so I would steer clear of Conor Gallagher, but where I would go is Brian and Bumo. Now, he's got seven shots in the box in the last four game weeks, more than any player on screen. Doesn't offer much in terms of expected assists. That seems to be Tony's role, but in terms of expected goals there, he has the best expected goals of all players on screen per 90 minutes. He's only getting 3.6 points per game, which kind of tells you that we have another troll on our hands, potentially another Traore, you could say. He's hit the post a lot, which is promising, but I would set your expectations pretty low for Mbumo. His highest score this season has been eight points, but for a 5.5 million midfielder, you don't really mind that. The reason I think he's good value is the price, and I think he will with the stats that he's got right now. I still think he will get the odd goal or attacking return, but Brentford's fixtures, particularly from game week 10, are so nice that I would contemplate doubling up on Brian and Bumo and Tony. And I think if you want a defender, I would go with Ethan Pinnock. So I think you could do a lot worse than any of the Brentford players. And for the price that Brian and Bumo is, it's a pretty low risk. If you're paying 5.5 million for a midfielder whose ceiling is an eight or nine pointer, you don't really mind that. Who's getting the, who's getting the expected data that he's getting. I think Brian and Bumo is a good shout. And he's someone that I'm looking to bring in this week for Traore. All right, which Chelsea defender or defenders should you be getting into your team for their really nice fixture run? There's no real arguing with their fixture run. You've got Norwich, Newcastle, and Burnley. I think if you're going to get a clean sheet in any three matches this season, those are the three matches that you would look to get a clean sheet in. Potentially, Newcastle away might be a little bit difficult from a clean sheet perspective, but Chelsea's defense are an absolute machine this season. They're getting clean sheets, but they're also getting attacking returns. And so if you don't have a Chelsea defender in your team, I would seriously consider getting one in. I don't think you need to go over the top. A lot of people are talking about having two some people are even talking about having three Chelsea defenders in your team. For me, I think one is kind of enough. 
You could argue for two, but Chelsea's expected goals conceded this season and even recently hasn't been that strong. I think they've been helped out a lot by having Mendy in goals. And for how long can he continue to be Superman in goals for? I'm not sure. So if you are thinking about getting a Chelsea defender into your team, right now the wing backs is where it's at. And you've got obviously the left-hand side with Chilwell and Alonso or the right-hand side with Reese James or Azpilicueta. Rudiger's there as you're pretty much nailed on centre-back who's going to offer you clean sheets and that's about it. So if you don't like too much risk or rotation in your team, I think Rudiger is still good value and it's still a good option for your team. But right now, the wing backs is where it's at. And so, do you go on the left wing back or do you go to the right wing back side? Right now, Chelsea's attack seems to be quite skewed towards their left wing back. Whether it's Chilwell or Alonso, these guys are the ones who are getting the most shots in the box. Now, Chilwell's only played two games but he's registered five shots in the box already this season, which is only one behind Alonso, who's played the majority of games this season. So Chilwell's come in, and he's been on absolute fire. 11.5 points per game. That is unsustainable for sure. But right now, it shows you how good Ben Chilwell has been since he's coming to that Chelsea team, but also how good it is to have a left wing back from Chelsea. Ben Krellen posted on Twitter some really interesting comparisons between Ben Chilwell and Reese James. Ben Chilwell versus Reese James under Thomas Tuchel. Ben Chilwell has had 13 starts compared to Reese James's 15, so very similar there, but appearances off the bench. Chilwell has never made an appearance off the bench compared to Reese James's eight. Ben Chilwell has stayed on the bench 13 times, whereas Reese James has only stayed on the bench twice. Chilwell's averaging 6.3 points per appearance, whereas Reese James is averaging 3.4 points per appearance. And their expected points is 5.3 for Ben Chilwell compared to 4 for Reese James. So what that tells us is if you're playing left wing back, so if you've got Ben Chilwell or if you've got Marcus Alonso in your team, if they're not playing, it's very unlikely that they're going to be subbed on. And that's what you want. If you've got the coverage on the bench, and this season we do have the coverage on the bench with guys like Livermento and Duffy, if you've got the coverage on the bench, it sucks, but you don't really mind it if one of these guys misses out entirely. What you do mind is if Reese James comes on for a one-minute, one-pointer like he did in game week eight. He blocks someone like Livermento, straight away you're five points down. So if you are going to be picking a Chelsea defender, I think right now the answer is to go with either Ben Chilwell or Marcus Alonso. In this case, I would go with Ben Chilwell. If he doesn't start, it's very unlikely he's going to come on. You'll have someone like Livermento come off your bench, and that's not a bad thing to have right now. Livermento's playing really well. But if you want to have that assured starter for Chelsea, he's going to get the clean sheets. You could couple Ben Chilwell with Rudiger or even Azpilicueta. Azpilicueta has played a lot of minutes recently, and I wouldn't be surprised to actually see him rested in that game against Norwich. Not saying you should go out and sell Azpilicueta by any stretch of the imagination. If you've got any of these guys, I think think you hold and you just hope for the best this weekend. I wouldn't want to take any Chelsea player out before they play Norwich. But if you've got the funds available, if you've got the transfers available, Ben Chilwell would be top of my shopping list. I don't think you need to take a minus four for any of these guys. Remember, if you take a minus four for a defender, they have to get an attacking return just to break even. That negative four wipes out the clean sheet, basically. And if, if something was to happen and Chelsea give away a penalty or Norwich get a fluky goal, then it's very likely you're going to be down on those points. I don't think you need to be going out and taking a minus four for any of their players. If you were desperate to take a minus four, Ben Chilwell is probably the one that I would go with. But keep an eye on the minutes in the Champions League. If he plays 90 minutes in the Champions League, then perhaps Marcus Alonso comes in for that game against Norwich. So... Just keep an eye on the minutes in the Champions League. I do have Rudiger. I would like to get Chilwell into my team. I just don't see a route to get Chilwell into my team without taking a hit. And I don't really want to be taking a hit this week. So that's my recommendation. I would go with Chilwell. And if you wanted to get a second Chelsea defender, go with Rudiger. I wouldn't go with Chilwell and Alonso because what's because what you're effectively doing is paying 5.7 or 5.9 for a bench player. Just go with one of them and have the bench player like Livermento or Duffy come on if they don't play. 
All right, that's the Game Week 9 preview video for you this week. I hope you liked that. Make sure you smash that like button. Subscribe as well if you're new around here. If you've got any questions that I haven't answered, make sure you put them in the comment section below. I write back to each and every single comment. Thanks again for watching. All the best for Game Week 9. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video.